If you are the Son of God, turn those stones into bread. And what did Jesus say? Man does not live, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's the problem. He doesn't live on bread alone, on bread alone, but he does need bread. You see, it would be so much easier, the equation, if it's just we have God as God or we have money as God. The reality is that because we live in bodies, we are human beings, we need material things as well. But those things cannot be our God because they end up choking us to death. Only God can be God. And it's by having God as truly God in our lives that we're able to have the wisdom and the self-control to keep all these other things in check. I remember a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, who died prematurely, he was at 50 or 51 years of age, and uh, back in the year 2000, Anyway, Peter was a very successful technician. He had a lovely company, and he would uh, yeah, go and fix all sorts of computers and so forth. And he said to me, you know, Mark, and he had a tragic well, difficulties in his own life. His marriage had failed. He'd raised up four children on his own. And uh, anyway, and he did a good job of that as well. But he said to me, when I'm praying and getting preoccupied with my work and so forth, <clears throat> Excuse me. I said to God, God, give me enough money so that I can look after my family. But don't give me so much money that I will forget you, that I'll be absorbed in it. Don't give me so little either that I'll be scrounging around looking for a way to feed my family that I forget you in that way as well. <coughs> so it was a beautiful little prayer and I've never forgotten it. In other words, Pray that you may have enough to live on. One of the big dangers of our age, and I'd say of our age more, not because it did not exist before, but because there's so much plenty in our country, is this, that very often wants, wishes are made into needs. We say, I need this, I need that, I need a new car, I need a different house, I need a new television set, I need a new computer, I need a whatever, whatever it happens to be. But do I really need that? Or is it really, I want that, I would like that? I love to turn back to my forebears, and I think, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. How did people get by? when I start feeling as if I have to depend on something in order to have a decent and happy life. And I think, yeah, they got by. They got by. They may have done it a bit tougher. And then I use that to help me gauge on where I am today. In times gone by, yes, things were tougher because there wasn't the abundance around. But, and that doesn't mean that we should go back in time and not use the good things that are there. But it helps us to gauge what of the good things that are around now do I need, are essential, are helpful genuinely, and what can I do without? Because that's where the difference is between needs and wants. We need material things. We need money to live off. But we don't need so much that we forget who is God in our lives. Saint, Saint, probably a man who is Saint, I'm not sure, but he, uh, I'm sure he's in heaven, he was such a, a devout Christian. C.S. Lewis, who I believe wrote the statements once, once upon a time, he said, Either God is Lord of all, or He is not Lord at all. Let's just hear that again. Either God is Lord of all, or He is not Lord at all. What did he mean by this statement? He meant, if God isn't truly God of the whole of your life, 
then is he truly God of your life? And the answer is no. If I have little corners of my life that I keep tucked away inside of me, and I don't give them to him, and he's asking them from me, then is he really in charge of my life? Because that's what it means to be Lord of my life. That God is in charge of every aspect of my life. Now, if you're like me, I don't want to impose anything on you, but I'll talk about myself, that I've given my life to God to His service. But what I also find is that certain things I've given to Him, at times I want to take them back. In other words, I don't constantly want to give all of my life to God. I want to give Him what's comfortable to give Him, what I would like to give Him, what I feel like giving to Him. Get the drift? In other words, what God asks of me in my life, yeah, those things that I feel like giving that are easy to give, and those things that are more costly to give, because I have an attachment to them. And the biggest attachment that I have are things to do most intimately with myself, my own thoughts and feelings, my comforts, those things, without going into specifics, but they are the things, and Jesus says to me, I want you to surrender those things to me. I want you to hand them over to me. And I say, I don't want to. I like them, actually. I like just the way they are. I want to be, he says, but you won't be as happy. You won't be as happy. And then I think about it again, and I say, I repent. And I say, yeah, you're right. You know, I want to give it to you. But then, you know, two, three days later, I have second thoughts again, and I want to start taking them back. So it's this tug of war that goes on. And you know what? To some extent, every single one of us does that. And so that's why it's difficult. We need to therefore see who is the real God of our lives. And the fact is, God is God of our lives. That's why we are here. But is He the God of our entire life? Or is He God only over those parts of our lives until it is no longer convenient for us? The moment that starts to happen, when we reject God from those areas of our lives because it's inconvenient for us, and inconvenience is in so many different ways, <coughs> not just you know making the effort to come to Mass on Sunday, or making the effort to pray a little bit in the family, or to read some scripture each day, but in a whole lot of other ways. But the moment I start to shut God out from some sections of my life, then it's like having a false god, idolatry, I have a statue. And the moment I don't want the god to tell me what to do in my life, I will take the statue and put him on the shelf. So I can control God, not God controls me. But it's only when I surrender myself completely to God so that he can control my entire life that then I can experience that deep joy that knows I am loved by Him and the deep peace that comes from Him alone. In so far as I want to be the master of God, God will just let me smash my head on the brick wall or the stone wall or any other wall we want. And eventually I'll be exhausted and I'll be crushed and I'll recognize my failure, that my way isn't the right way. And at all, at various times in our lives, we all think, you know, my way is the right way. I want to do it my way. My way. And our culture glorifies this mentality. But in fact, if we're going to get it right, we've got to do it God's way. Sometimes at funerals, one of the big, you know, uh, some people want to play the, the Frank Sinatra song, you know, I did it my way. I did it my way. If we're going to get to heaven, my brothers and sisters, it's because we do it God's way or no other way. There's no doing it my way. And if we die in that state of being partially God's and partially belonging to material goods or money or whatever it is, then we will spend that time in purgatory being purified in God's love until we can get rid of those things to which we are still attached 
And what do you think is going to happen to me as those things are torn from my heart? I suffer. And the suffering in purgatory is a profound suffering. The church doesn't teach anything about this. The various saints have received visions from the souls in purgatory that tell them the terrible sufferings they experience. In fact, they'll say things like, which seem extraordinary to, to me anyway, that you know, one moment, one minute, so to speak, in purgatory is you know, more than a hundred years of the most terrible suffering on earth. Wow. And to think that God gives me and you the opportunity to be free from these things in this life and to be able to merit from them from the experience of the purification. So, we have that choice again. And as I said, we have given our lives to God. But to what extent? And as we grow older and mature, the Lord reveals to us that what we've given Him up to a certain point is now no longer sufficient. The way I gave myself to God as a child of nine, say, is no, was not enough when I was 15. And what I gave to God when I was 15 was not enough when I was 25. God always wants more. I remember a homily that a priest gave to a young couple on their wedding day. And he said, you love each other very much right now. And that's fantastic. May it continue to grow. But he said to them, the love you have for each other now will not be enough in 10 years' time. And the love you'll have for each other in 10 years' time will not be enough in 20 years' time. In other words, we must keep on growing. This is the only way to eventually belong totally to God. So just ask ourselves some questions today. What am I attached to? What do I find difficult to hand over to God? Is it actually money? Is it very grasping of me? Is that what it is? Or is it my material things? Is it my opinions, my feelings, my wishes? What are the things? And to pray a little bit about that today. I want to tell you a lesson when that hit me 17 years ago, and I'll finish with this story. I was, uh, how old was I? About 32. And I was ready to go to World Youth Day. I may have shared this story with some of you. But anyway, it's uh, worth telling again. And I looked, and I was about to fly out to World Youth Day, the, the pilgrimage there on the following Sunday. So this is Monday morning of the week before. And I looked into my bank account. There was only $200 left. And I was complaining to God because I didn't have enough money to be able to buy a lunch to some of the young adults that I was taking with me on pilgrimage. And I was complaining how I'd given him my life and he said he would look after me and provide for all the things that I need. Yeah, I was a little witch, I know. It wasn't very virtuous of me, but anyway, I was. And then I made this, it was a whinging prayer, if you could call it that. And then I just forgot I said it. Well, the next day, or that same afternoon, I forget now, two funerals came in for later that week. Each of them had a stipend attached to them. Okay. And then on the Saturday morning, I was having breakfast with some friends of mine who knew I was going overseas. Well, they gave me this envelope with a waft of cash in there, already converted into the currency of the different countries that I was visiting. So, oh, wow, thank you very much. And then that afternoon, I was doing some other things as well, and they gave me some money as well. And, and then I got home, and I was ready to pack up and just you get ready for flying out the next day. And all this <coughs> money was in my hands. And then what happens? Then God convicts me. And reminds me of those words from the scriptures, put me and my kingdom first, and all these other things will be given to you. God knew what I needed. He was testing me. Will I trust in him? Will I trust that he cares over my life? Mark, just keep on doing what I want you to do. Trust me. Trust me. I'll provide for you. And I will set you free. Well, when I heard those words again, I felt about that big. But that's exactly how big I was at that moment. 
And from that moment till now, and God, there are other areas God's still working on, I've tried to keep an open-handed policy, so to speak, so that, yes, give money away, give things away, but then when you've got an open-handed policy, you can also receive more. And that's what I've found. Whenever God's put something on my heart to be generous with someone I see a need, interestingly, a week later, two weeks later, more comes in. Not necessarily the same currency, but more comes in. And I realize, thank you, my Heavenly Father, you have not let me down. 